just last night I was um, sitting down and all the kids were gone and my wife was doing that grocery shopping thing. How many of you moms know about that, right? It's like the groceries don't just stock themselves in the pantry or the fridge. And, you know, sometimes as a house full of boys, we think uh, there's no food in the pantry or the fridge. And, you know, I don't know if you know what I'm talking about, but um, it just goes. And, you know, it's like, Mom, what, what, why is there not food? You know, it's like someone's got to go get it. She said, you know, so, so she was out doing that. And, um, and so I was at home just... Uh, just, just preparing. Saturday night is typically just where I even just get quiet from what I had during the week and just reaccount it. And you know, um, I picked up this, this notebook of mine. It's, um, it's fairly old. Um, I don't know if you have any notebooks that you don't finish. Yeah. yeah? So I got lots of notebooks. This one's from 16. And, um, and yet it has notes from 24. And that, you know, so because I really like this notebook a lot. I just like the, well, I, I had lost this notebook. Um, I had misplaced it, and I had found it just probably a month ago. So I was just going through, and, uh, and I was reading some things that the Lord had said to me. And, you know, I, I just found myself going, thank you, Lord. Thank you for your words. They changed everything. And I was just reminded of the time um, as a young man, I was sitting, invited by what is now my wife. Um, I was in eighth grade, and I was invited to sit on the front row of church. And I knew who I was. I knew who I wasn't. And uh, so I got invited to sit on this front row. And I remember the pastor, he would, uh, they had a platform, but he'd always walk down like this, you know. And I had these big old long legs. I was like Jeremiah's size, 6'2". And, and my legs, I, you know, he'd walk right here, you know. And I, I mean, the le- I, I had to pull my feet in, you know what I mean? Because I was worried that he'd... But then I was also thinking, like, he's going to call out all my sins. You know, like, because I know that even my thoughts towards my girlfriend were not like, you know, I just like her teeth, you know, or... <laughs> You know, I mean, I thought she was pretty, you know, I mean, and uh, just as a young man, I just, I, I didn't, I, I just had just a lot of fear there. And um, after that service, uh, there was a lady that was sitting behind me. I didn't know, know it. And she had came up to me. Um, she had actually told uh, my, my wife's mom that, that yeah, who's that young man that was sitting uh, with you guys this morning? And she said, oh, that's my... Um, my daughter's, you know, she's seventh grade. So seventh grade, eighth grade, you know, we were just extra mature, you know. Um, that's my, my daughter. He likes my daughter. And, and, and they let that happen. I, I know that, right? I'm like, oh, Lord, Jesus, right? Now, and, uh, and they just said, we just see, we just feel like that, that's right. So we're, you know, you can't, you don't determine things based on age. You determine things based on a witness. You don't determine what job you're going to take because the paycheck, the numbers say this, 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 and this. You determine based on the witness. The Bible says that we're to be led by his spirit. So he witnesses, he testifies with us, to us, to our spirit, right? That's how, that's how we, we lead our lives, right? We, we take the following of the witness of the Holy Ghost. So if you don't have a witness on it, it doesn't matter if it looks great. It's a no. It's a no. And so you follow peace, right? And so uh, anyway, and so this lady had said uh, to her that, uh, that, wow, well, that man, that young man, it's like the, during the middle of service, the Lord just started talking to me about this, you know, that young man. And, and uh, anyway, she told me, her mom told me afterwards, and I told her, no, uh-uh, uh uh <laughs> In other words, I couldn't believe, I couldn't believe that, that somebody would say words to me that were like that. And I told, uh, which is my, now my mother-in-law, I told Susan, I said, nah, nah. And I remember just leaning against the stage and I was like, whatever. You know, just too good to be true, kind of a thought. And so she proceeded to go get her. And I'm telling you the story. And so this lady comes back and she said, and she tells me while I'm leaning against the stage, she goes, today when Pastor was teaching, 
halfway through the service, the Lord just started talking to me about you. And I want you to know the call of God is all over your life. And I'm like, no. Nah. And she's like, I'm telling you. And I remember just going, what? Me? God, you'd want to use me? Now, I haven't told my testimony for a number of years, but I remember in fourth grade having moved from the small town of Brainerd, Minnesota country to the big city. We moved into some neighbors. We played soccer in their backyard and football. It was a great neighborhood, all that kind of stuff. And we got to sleep over and, you know, play Super Nintendo. It was awesome. And so I found myself over there quite a bit. And one night while we were having a sleepover, the eighth grade brother came down and typed in some code on one of those big projection TVs. You remember the big projection TVs? Like, and, uh, and while all of a sudden what popped on was um, porn, naked ladies. I hadn't seen that before. Okay? So I'm in fourth grade, and, uh, and I'm, like, I'm like all of a sudden super nervous because what's going on. Uh, but yet I'm like, this is crazy. This is cool. This is great. This is terrible. I want out of here, I want more. Okay, so there was this war going on on the inside, and yet this outside of a flesh and a heart that wants what's right, you know. Yeah. And so um, I found myself in that, in that predicament, and, uh, and, and I liked it. And then I uh, ended up getting invited to a birthday party after they, they had moved, and they went to another place, and guess what? We uh, got to put on while we were at that birthday party. More channel. More of that. And so just in fourth grade, going into fourth grade and in fourth grade, um, I became very dirty. I felt very um, ashamed. Um, and yet I wanted more of, uh, of seeing what I saw as a fourth grader. I, I, I didn't know. I just, I just knew that naturally it was like, oh, wow, that's pretty, right? Or cool. I don't even know how to describe it as a fourth grader. I don't even know. And, and, and a lot of you here... Um, uh, you don't, moms and dads don't know, but you know. <laughs> I'm going to say that again. Moms and dads don't know, but you know. And even the uh, conversations that you've had with mom and dad, um, because of shame, you hide and you lie. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Shame causes you to hide and to lie. And what happened that day uh, on the stage, it changed my life. I heard the love of God is what I heard. Like I had never heard it. And, and I knew me. But see, what I was looking at was I was looking at all the outside. That's what we do, isn't it? We're really good at that, looking at the outside. If I was more proficient in computers, I would have had a bunch of pictures on the stage. We're up on the screen this morning. And I had a picture of, I'm just going to use some words to describe pictures of people, okay? I would have had a picture of someone on meth. Well, I don't know what picture you're seeing. Maybe you're seeing somebody that is eyes are sunk in. Maybe, do they have all their teeth? Are they rotted out? Or somebody on heroin, do they have a ball on their arm for where they shoot up? Or how about this? How about a prostitute? Now, what does that look like to you? Oh, how about this? This is just as equal. How about a self, somebody that's self-righteous? Amen. How about a liar? I guess we could put any one of your faces up here. A thief? Any one of our faces up here? Oh, by the way, addict, an addict could put any one of your faces up here, my face included. Do you understand what I'm saying? Every one of these things, is just, I was just thinking about how um, we, I could just put pictures up. And you would be able to look at that picture, and you would be able to make a judgment call of like, oh, that is, like if I put a picture of a girl with hardly any clothes, you might think that that would be the prostitute or the stripper. Any, anybody know what I'm talking about? Because you all profile. <laughs> you all be profile, and you know, people say, Don't, profile. Um, and, we, and we do that all the time. Matter of fact, I brought this uh, in case I got hungry uh, this morning. And, you know, just in case you, anybody have one of these at home? You know, a jar? You know what this is? Can somebody tell me what this is? Huh? 
Somebody help me out. Louder. Nuts. 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 Mixed nuts. Okay, good. You could see it because you're close. We had a mixed nuts. Um, actually, it's not mixed nuts. It was mixed nuts, but now it's, um, it's not. It's one of these jars. Jack, will you come on up here? Jack Montgomery. Uh, this is a guy that's very qualified to tell me and tell you what's in this jar. Can I, you have a mic can, uh, real quick? Because he has these jars. I've been to his shop. All right. Check, check. So can you tell me what's it? You have these? Do you have this at your house? Your... I do. You do? Okay, so you're qualified to tell me what's in there. We've got bolts and screws. Bolts, screws, that's it. Washers. Washers. Well, I see. What else you got? <laughs> so that's it, right? See, this is what you got to do at my house. Yeah, that's you dump it out. And you sort through it for what's useful and what, what you need at the time. Correct. But the thing is, you were wrong about all of that. Oh, yeah? Yep. Yeah, those are washers, and those are nuts, and those are, but you're looking at the outside. What are those? Metal. That's right. They're metal. Well, I would say it this way, if you have a jar, and you, you probably have a pile of this, something called, uh, that you take down to buds. Mm -hmm. What do you Scrap. call that? Scrap. That's what this is. Scrap. But we classify it so often by the outside. But the Lord looks where? At the inside. So I was thinking about the picture of people, you know, just different people. Like maybe you're driving down the road and you see somebody on the street corner and you think, man, they should get a job. Maybe you're, I don't know. We classify things all the time. But um, do you identify with them? Do you identify with who you are? You know, not as a bolt. Not as a screw or a nut, but as who you are as a, at the core. Metal. Or let me say it this way. You identify them with them as who you are at the core. Humanity. Do we? Do we know who we are? Do we know, let me say it this way, who we once were? Do you know the Bible talks about from dust to Dust. You, you, every one of us came from the same thing. And yet God is so mindful of your dust. He doesn't look on the outside, but we do. And we think, man, because of, because of I, I've got all this together, i got all my stuff in the right place, now I'm useful to God. Now I'm valuable. But the value to you and me that we have to God is not based on what our outside looks like. You know what God does with you when you get born again with all your outside? He melts it. Like a pile of scrap. And the Bible tells us that when we're born again, we, uh, the old is gone and he, we become a new creation. Yes. Wow, isn't that cool? God takes all the what we're trying to work up to and, and work for, and he melts all that, and he says, I'm going to make you who I've called you to be. I'm going to create in you a new identity, and you know what I'm going to make you? I'm going to give you something that you didn't earn, and I'm going to give you, just like this, this gift of righteousness. Amen. Meth. Prostitute. Addict. No, no, no. Dust. Man. In need of a Savior. Whose price was paid by Jesus. And all you have to do is to believe on Him. And He says, I'll give you this gift of righteousness. So, then our, so let me say it this way. We don't have a, a sin problem as much as we have an identity problem. Yeah, that's right. So uh, next time you see somebody that's struggling, could you identify with them? You know, we have this uh, on the back wall. It's that we remember. We remember where we came from. Yeah. 
Do we remember where we came from? Do we remember who, who we are? Do we remember that while we were yet sinners, this is in Ephesians, that while we were yet sinners, because of God's great love for us, wow, he came. So I want to talk this morning, this, we're actually starting a, a new series, um, because faith works by love, but so many times we think that faith that works by love is our love. You know, the fruit of the Spirit, which has been taught so often as things that we're supposed to produce. In other words, we're supposed to perform instead of things that come from a seed. A seed of the Spirit. A seed of the Word of God. When I sow to the Spirit, when I sow, I reap of the Spirit. So those fruits, uh, they come from, from sowing. But faith works by love. What love? God's love. God's love. The love of God for me. So many times we think that the love that we're struggling in life because uh, we, we don't have enough love for God. Can I say it this way? That that's, that's a lie. The reason you and I struggle with sin or we struggle with identity, we struggle, it's because we don't know enough of the love of God. We don't have enough of his love. We don't, we don't know and may haven't made that our own. God loves you. It's something we hear and we've heard and we've maybe even sang a song. Jesus loves me, right? Or we say God loves you. And what does that mean? What does that even mean anymore? Do we know? Do we? And I think that it's easy to come to church and having heard a message of Jesus that we don't really have an understanding or an intimacy of. Uh, and, and so it doesn't hold the, the, the strength or the power to us the way it's supposed to. So the, the, we're going to be in this for a little bit. Uh, God loves you. God loves you. Me? Yeah. Scrap? Me. God loves the scrap in me. He loves uh, me from the inside out. While I didn't have anything together, he said, that's my boy. That'll mess you up. It'll rock your world. When you realize that you can live from the love of God instead of for the love of God, it'll change your life. That you can live from the love of God because he loves you instead of living for the love of God where I'm trying to live up or perform something just to get his approval. If I did enough right things, then I can get something. Prayers are hindered oftentimes because we don't know the love of God. What, it, what the enemy brings to us is our love for God. And if you really loved him, then when you wouldn't have done that. If you really loved him, then you wouldn't have done this. If you really loved him, you... And so we find ourselves in this place... And I'm going to have to side with the word of God here where it says man looks at the outside. I, I'm not saying this is only Sa Samuel here. Can I say that man looks at the outside? Can I say that that's still true? I just saw Jack do it. I just saw you all do it. You called this a, a jar of nuts. It wasn't a jar of nuts. Because you were convinced based on what was on the outside. You're convinced about your kids. You're convinced about yourself because of what you see on the outside where you're not able to do. Why do I do what I don't want to do? And so I classify myself I, I, because of what I see. What I see. And so I want to take some time uh, over the next few weeks to talk about the love of God. From the beginning, because I think we got to hear the, this, the story of, of God's love for us again and again. And uh, this is the foundation of Scripture, is Ephesians chapter 3, verse 18, uh, where he tells us that he, it was actually a prayer uh, for, for that church. I'll read it. It says, for this reason, I'm going to start in verse uh, 14, Ephesians 3, 14. It says, for this reason I bow my knees before the Father. So Paul says, I'm bowing my knees from whom every family, it's interesting, whom every family in heaven and earth derives its name. It kind of reminds me of all the nuts and the bolts melted together. You know, every person here derives its name. In other words, it comes under one name. 
And we classify ourselves, and they're them, and they're this, and they're that. And what happens is, is so many times with classification, I know he has this in his garage too, there becomes separation. We love because when things are separated based on classification. So on my bench, I have, I could always use more of them, drawers that have this size screw and this size nut and this size washer. And, this, and I love when I can go there and know, you know, I can pull out 14 different drawers to find the, the right size nut or the right size bolt that I need. Classification, we like to sort based on what, what, what people are. You know, they are this and they are this and they're Baptist and they're Pentecostal and they're that. Like we sort, but yet the Bible says if you're in Christ, every, all of heaven and earth derives its name from the core as his children, as a child of God. He says, uh, I ask, he, so he's praying, he's praying not, not for Beyond Church, not for First Baptist, not for United Methodists, he's praying uh, for the family of God. That the family of God would know something that's so vital and so important. The family of God that you would know. I, I don't know, I got three boys. You know what, my, my greatest prayer is that, and it's crazy when you, if, you, if you've ever not been a dad, then you become a dad. And some of you that haven't become a dad yet, and it's about to happen, you're like, I don't know how I'm going to love this, I don't know, but something happens. When you have that baby, you get, like Tice, when you were born, uh, dad was like, I love it. But then when your sister was born, he was like, I love her so much. But you know what was crazy? His love for you didn't lessen. His love for you was, I love Dice so much. And then God added too, I love, I love her so much. I love God. That's how God does. He doesn't. And so for me, my prayer is that, that my oldest son, Matthew, would know that I love him so much. Because he's mine. Because he's a gift. And then my prayer is that my middle one would know this, that I love you so much. No, not, not compared to this one. Not because the threads on that one are different than the threads on this one. Or this one functions this way and that one functions that way. No, I, I love you. And then my youngest one, I, I would want him to know, I love you. All that you are. All that you are. And so many times where we get stuck in the classification, it's what they're not. But anyway, let's keep going here. And so here's this prayer for the body of Christ, uh, Paul. And he says, he prays, um, let's go pick up in verse 16. I ask that out of the riches of God's glory, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Then... You being rooted and grounded in love will have power together with all the saints. With who? With all the saints. This is a prayer for all saints. This is not the prayer for elite. This is not the prayer for those who have the outward show together. You know, I was looking, I was, when I was going to pull some pictures and send them up to the, the media, uh, I, I typed in drug addict. And uh, so you had pictures of guys that were, and ladies that were strung out, you know, and you had some snorting cocaine, some were pills, some were... But you know what? The one that I liked the best was this picture of this person, and they were doing this. And the mask was half off their face. They looked normal. And the mask was half off their face. And I was like, yep. Because anything that's associated with shame, we want to hide. And this is how the enemy works. He works in the darkness. You know how the enemy, he, he's able to keep you bound? Because you have to keep it hidden. He says, so I pray that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love will have power together with all the saints. This is verse 18. This is the, the core scripture that we're going to be talking on. To comprehend the length and the width. And the depth and the height of the love of God. You know, it's interesting, uh, even on this graphic, if you'll throw that graphic back up, uh, and talking with, uh, oh, it's right here. 
Um, you kinda, can you kind of see what's coming out of that heart? What is it? Arrows? What, can somebody maybe, huh? What is it? Direction? But what direction could it look like? It's something that's in maybe what Jesus hung on. It kind of is, isn't it? It's like from here to there, from there to here. It's kind of like that cross, isn't it? The love of God. And so that's what we're going to talk about uh, through this series. He says that you would be able to uh, know with all the saints the length, the width, the height, and the depth of the love of Christ. And to know. To know meaning intimate. To know meaning intercourse. That's what that word is. To know. Like where Mary said, I know how can this be? Because I know not a man. In other words, I haven't been intimate with someone. He said, I pray that you would, ha- you would know intimately for yourself God's love. He said, this love you can't get here. He says it surpasses knowledge. You can't understand it. But you can experience it. You can't, it doesn't make sense to you, nah, nah, not me. No, but I, you can't take from me. You can't take, and here's what he's saying, you can't take from someone the love of God once they've experienced it. And here's what he says, he says that they would know this love that surpasses knowledge and that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. The key to walking and and carrying God anywhere is knowing how much you're loved, having experienced that. And here's what happens. He says, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we ask, think, or imagine according to his power that's at work within us. You know what the power that's at work within us? It's his love. It's interesting how love moved God to, to heal people. Love moved God to feed. Love moved God. Love is to move you and me. He says, uh, according to the power that's working in us, verse 21, now to him be the glory in the church and in Christ throughout all generations forever and ever. So here's what we're talking about this morning, the love of God. You know what we're going to talk about? We're going to talk about God's love being this big. I used to tell my oldest son this when uh, I, I love you, I love you. And he actually said, I love you. No, I love you. No, I love you. And... Uh, well, I love you this big. And he would say, well, I love you this much bigger. And I'd say, oh, yeah, well, I love you from here to here. And then he'd say, well, yeah, well, 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 well I love you from here all the way to here. I love you this much. That's what we're going to talk about, how much God loves us. And... Um, we have to see in the word, we have to be taught what the word says a, a little bit. We have to have a little more understanding that I think than we, than we often do. Um, starting in, uh, just real quick, 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him who had no sin uh, to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. This is what happened when God sent Jesus. There was this great exchange. He said, I'm going to send my son Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us so that we could be who he is. So it's interesting, even uh, even as you look back, uh, God wasn't concerned about sin all the way back, way back when Adam missed it. It's really interesting if you were to look at this. God wasn't so concerned about sin as as much as he was about fellowship. God wasn't concerned about sin. He was concerned about fellowship. He couldn't come to meet with the people. Matter of fact, if you look at the time that went on between uh, Genesis all the way until Moses came. You know, you can eat all the cookies you want and there's no problem. If you're a kid and the cookie jars on the counter, you can eat all the cookies you want and there's absolutely no problem. Until, until mama says... You can't have a cookie. Is that, am I right? There's no problem. You can have all the cookies you want, Kip. You can keep eating them. You can have as many as you want. There's no problem. You can have all the cookies unless mom says, hey, we're not having any cookies before dinner. Then, all of a sudden, if you sneak a cookie, and how many of you know, the cookies were sitting there the whole time until mom said, you can't have a cookie. Now, all of a sudden, it's like, I want a cookie. 
you know. It's kind of like the children of Israel. Never did they build a golden calf. For how many years? Never did they have another God before him. Until they said, we don't need a God. We need, we, we, we just tell Moses and just tell him to tell us what to do. And we can, we can do it. We can live up to what we're supposed to live up to. And the Lord says, you can't. He said, but if you think you can, here's what you need to live up to. And you know what? The moment the law was instituted, this is when that was reality was, is sin began to abound. Interesting. So as long as there's no law, right? As long as it, it's kind of like, as long as there wasn't a, a, a statement to Adam, don't eat off of this tree or eat off of that tree, could he have ate off the either tree? It would have been fine, wouldn't it have? Just something to think about. Now, let's go to Romans, Romans chapter 5. And we're going to spend a little bit of time here. Um, and, and before, you know, and as, as we're coming in here, we're going we're gonna to just spend most of our time this morning into Romans 5 because I don't have, we're, it, this is going to be a series that we build out here. Um, but how many of you know, uh, it seems as if in the church, um, Somehow we've moved to uh, a relationship with God that is very, um, it, it, it's very, it can be very volatile or it can be, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It, it, it's, not, it's not safe or, I, I wrote a word down here when I was thinking about it, uh, secure. You know, our relationship with God, let me say it this way, Acts 4.12 says that there is no other name in heaven and earth by which men can be saved. Have we taught that? Have how are you to be born again? Call on the name of Jesus, right? We, so we teach this that you cannot be saved by any way except for calling on the name of the Lord. So we, we, that's the only way. We, we'll, we'll, we'll preach that. But then some, and it's like, uh, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, you're saved. So salvation comes that way. And, and yet, it's like, it's crazy how our relationship, we've let it become so unsecure, like we could lose our salvation in a moment. Like salvation had to do with you and your works and my works. And it doesn't. I know this is just jacking with some of us and we just might have to go to read Galatians and spend some time there. We have to just go read Romans and have to explain to the Romans who were very intellectual the, the power of uh, uh, of, of, and the, the greatness of the gift of Jesus. But my salvation doesn't depend on my works. Holy, like, and so this is, this is something that's interesting. Um, I could, I, you can talk to any person. You can see this uh, with, in the Bible. If, if God was to show up uh, to a sinner, they would recognize that God is holy. How many of you know that like, that's everybody's response? I'm sinner, I'm unrighteous, I'm unworthy, you're here and I'm here. Like no one has to be taught that. A sinner doesn't have to be taught the holiness of God. Everybody knows it. But you know what we have to be taught? The love of God. I got to know the love of God. He said, I pray that you would know the love of God. This is the prayer that Paul, that we would know the love of God. And from that place of knowing the love of God, there would be glory. The goodness of God would be displayed through the church. There would be a, a ministry that the people, you and I, would carry to reconcile people back to God. Reconcile, be reconciled. There's a ministry of reconciliation. Say, come, come back to God. I implore you, come back to the Lord. Thank you, Lord. So let's uh, turn here with me. Um, thank you, Lord. For, I'm, I'm going to just quote Romans chapter 8. For I am convinced, I don't know if you're convinced yet, this is what Paul says. For I am convinced, Romans 8, 38, that neither death or life, neither angels or principalities, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, or anything else in all of creation, even if you missed it last night, You're made righteousness by calling on the name of the Lord, and you're saved, but we're so, so many times we're, so, we're made unrighteous. No, no, no. My righteousness is not based on my works. My righteousness is a gift. Wow. 
Yeah, well, so you're saying I don't have to live righteous? Uh, your righteousness comes when you know the love of God. Your righteousness is not, is not a product of your love for God. You're right. My righteousness is not a product of my love for God. My righteousness is a product of the love of God for me. And so he gave me the gift of righteousness. And from that gift, because I've been loved much, oh, I love much. If I struggle to love, it's because I, I, I have a struggle uh, to receive his love. That's the only reason I struggle in any way. I, I, because I identify with myself of the outside. Yeah. Not only do I measure other people by the outside, but I see me in all that I am or all that I'm not. And so because of that, I struggle to receive the love of God. But let me tell you, there is, I'm convinced neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities, neither present nor future or any powers, neither height or depth or anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Nothing can separate you from God's love. Wow. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So we're going to just spend, uh, if you have your Bibles this morning, turn with me to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. So starting in verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith. How are you justified? Through faith. So it wasn't anything you did. It's what you believed. It's what you received. In order to believe something, you have to receive something. In order to believe the word of God, you have to receive the word of God. Faith is received in the heart, and then you, you, take, you receive that, and you act on that. Or you would, in a sense, have a corresponding action. We believe, and therefore we speak. It's with the heart, the Bible says in Romans, with that man believe, but it's with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So this is, we believe. And so here's what he says. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. It doesn't say, since we have been justified because we've done everything right this last week, we have peace with God and we can now ask and our prayers will be heard. It doesn't say, uh, because, um, because I stopped smoking four years ago, um, I now have peace with God and I can believe him to heal my lung cancer. Does anybody ever have a product of their choice that has produced some, in a sense, death in their life, and they, you just think it's owed to you? You know, you know how I know that that's every person in here? Because man looks at the outside. Because we're so consumed by the outside. And when we're so consumed by the outside, what happens is, is, is in a sense, we are... Uh, conformed to this world instead of transformed, or instead of letting the inside live out. So he says, through whom we have gained access, verse 2, through Christ we've gained access by faith into his grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in, in the hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we also, I'm, I'm going to just take some time to read here. Do we read and understand Scripture? This is kind of like a teaching morning, just for a, this the next 20 minutes, just teaching. Let's just go through just Romans 5, and let's just talk about it for a second. But I thought about just talking to like somebody on the stage this morning about Romans 5. You know, but instead we're just all in chairs this morning. But what does it look like? It says this, not only that, but we also rejoice in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character hope. And hope does not disappoint because God has poured out his love in our hearts. So what is he saying here? He's saying that, that you don't have, when you have hope because of the love of God, that picture, you can believe in hope. This is like Abraham. You, you can believe in hope. Who against hope believed in hope. Why? Because of the love of God. There, there are pictures, guys, there are pictures that we, we need to start reasoning from the mercy of God. More than our outward sign. What's the mercy of God? His goodness and his covenant loyalty. we got to start reasoning from just his mercy and, and the fact that we know how to give good gifts to our children. How much more does our father know how to give good gifts to those who love him? How, do you think 
We could reason, begin to reason from the love of God and not let our hope, oh, I don't want to get my hopes up. I don't want to get my hopes up that maybe I saw my son come to church and, or maybe he called me and he said, hey, I don't want to get my hopes up. No, you get your hopes up. Why? Because of the love of God. Not because of your love for God, but because of his love for you. Get your hopes up. This is why we don't pray the prayer of faith to see the sick healed. This is why we don't pray the prayer of faith to see the dead raised or to cast out the oppression on somebody because we don't want to get our hopes up. Why do we not want to get our hopes up? Because we're not convinced of the love of God. And somehow we've moved to the outwards, the outward. As a church, we went back to the outward as the church. But it is the grace of God that saves us. It's the grace of God, his goodness, his kindness, his faithfulness, that which faith stands, the Bible says, is the faith rests on grace. So if I don't have the foundation of God's goodness towards me, then I will have no faith to lay hands on. I'll have no faith to pray in any way. I'll have no faith if I don't have the foundation right of grace, which comes from his love for me. God loves me. Somebody needs to just say that. God loves me. Verse 6. For at just the right time, while we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. If you're godly, he didn't die for you. Do you know there's like one place that you can fall from grace? It's when you don't need, you don't need grace. You know, there's anybody ever here been ever been scared about like the impardonable sin? Like, did I commit the sin? Like, well, if you have ever been afraid that you would have fallen from grace, can I say this? You've not fallen from grace. <laughs> but if you don't need grace, you've fallen from it. Yeah, sure. You've fallen from grace. He says, at just the right time while we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man some might possibly dare to die. Oh, I die for, you know, you die for your son. You, die, you see this in our, our military, dying for a country or die for their children, for their future. For, so, but he says that people don't die for, for unrighteous people. He said, but God, while we were ungodly, he sent his son Christ to die. Verse 8. <clears throat> but God proves his love for us in this. This is the proof of God's love for you and me. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. With no, there was no extension of your hand. There was no extension of my hand. It, while I was in the middle of watching whatever, well, while I was in the middle, he said, I love that. He said, I'm going to give my son and pay the price for his sins. Christ died for us. Therefore, verse 9, since we have now been justified, how are we justified? By his blood. How much more shall we be saved from wrath through him? For if when we were enemies of God, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, while we were enemies to God, we were made back to right with God, reconciled, things made back because of Jesus. This is, this is incredible to be reading and be going, how does this work? I don't know. God's love. This is why we have to hear about it a little bit more. I, I, I can't grasp it here, but I, but I can hear it here. And thank God his words are spirit, and his words are able to teach and shape and, and, and train in righteousness and, and to rebuke and to correct where we're wrong and where we're too focused on the outside and where our faith is hindered because we're, all of what we see, instead of knowing how much we're loved, we don't know how to ask for what we're supposed to ask for because we're not even convinced that he would. We know he could, but I don't know if he would. I know I would for my kids, but I don't know if he would for me. Because your love is so much greater for your kids than his is. Did you die? Did you send a kid for your kid? Like, no. 
So asking, asking, having the boldness to ask. It's so funny. I, we're kind of graduated from this, but there was a time when my youngest son, who my older two thought was more innocent than them, that's why they would send him in to ask for what they wanted. Therefore, this is Hebrews, therefore let us come boldly to the throne of grace to get what you and I need. The grace, the throne of, what's it called? It's the throne of grace. To get what we need, to get help, to grace, that what we need. You and I, we need to stop sending someone else because God sent Jesus. Stop sending somebody else to pray the prayer of faith for you because God saw you and he sent his son Jesus for you. So stop sending somebody else. God sent you and he sent you into this world. Stop sending someone else. God sent Jesus for you. He loves me. He loves you. God loves you. God loves you. God loves you. You know what you, that's, that's for them and that's for them and that's for them. That's something, a message that you and I have to carry. God loves you. Man, God loves you. That's right. That's right. You know how you can do that? When you identify with them. Not the outside, but who they are. The same way that God looks at them. God, give me eyes to see. Give me eyes to see. Give me eyes to see them. Give me eyes to see the world as you see them. Verse 10, for if when we were enemies of God, we are reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more than having been reconciled shall we be saved by his life? Not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have received, now received, reconciliation. You know what that means? All things are right. Because you did right? Why are things right? Because of Jesus. So things are right. Well, what about when you missed it? Are things right? Well, they're not right until I get them right. It's the most amazing thing at how fragile grace has become. You know, that you and, your, and me and my super amazing ability could, could, could ruin the plan of God in a moment. You're pretty powerful. It's pretty prideful to think that. Verse 12, therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, this is just proving to you and me. Paul is proving and talking to the church at Rome who were very lifted up in their minds. And they had, to, they had to have understanding. I mean, they sat at the, uh, at the gates I mean, uh, and listened to philosophy and all that. He's talking to them about who they are and about who Christ is and who he's came for them. He says this, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, death through sin, so also death was passed on to all men because all sinned. For sin was in the world before the law was given. This is good. This is important to Take this, in, take this really in. There's verse 13. Sin was in the world before the law was given. But sin is not taken into account when there is no law. It's kind of like the cookie jar on the counter. Sin's not taken into account when there is no law. So man was doing flesh things. But because there was no law, sin wasn't taken into account. Everybody wasn't perfect before Moses received the law from the Lord. But yet there was just, sin had entered. And it entered because of one man. Verse 14, nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses. So death reigned. Sin didn't reign, but death reigned. Death, because the wages of sin is death. So man wasn't ever meant to die. It's interesting when you look at the lifespan of humanity in the Bible before Moses. Like it, was, it took a long time. Like, you know, Methuselah before the flood and, and all the, the crazy that was going on. We're talking years and years and years. Because man wasn't made to die. The effects of sin took a while to bring death. 
Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam unto Moses, uh, even over those who did not sin in the way that Adam transgressed. He is the pattern of the one to come. In other words, where sin entered, death entered. Now here's what's going to enter. Righteousness. Let's keep going. But the gift is not like the trespass. So the gift, what's the gift? Jesus. The gift that God has given to you and me, the gift of righteousness, it's not like the trespass. This is verse 15. For if the, if the many died by the trespass of one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abound to many? If one man's offense, again, verse 16, again, the gift is not like the result of one man's sin. The judgment that followed one sin brought condemnation. One sin brought condemnation. This was the judgment. Adam sinned. One sin condemned all. He says this, but the gift that followed many trespasses. How, how many times have you missed it? Many? You missed it many? I missed it many. I, I missed it many. More than my hands and toes can count. I've missed it many. Nor can the gift that God, it says the judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift that followed many trespasses brought what? How is that possible? The grace of God. The grace of God. The gift of Jesus. The gift of God's love for you and me. It's always been about his love for us. It wasn't about sin. It was about fellowship. This is why he wants us to come. Verse 17. So it brought justification. For if by the trespass of the one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive, somebody needs to underline that, those who receive, this is something you and I have to receive. Just like I was sharing my testimony. Nuh-uh. -uh can't be. You don't know you don't you don't know me. Look. You don't you don't know me. God doesn't hasn't been looking at the mask the whole time, bud. He hasn't been looking at the whole the mask at any time. We see the mask. You fool some, but you don't fool God. He looked beyond the mask the whole time. And yet his his love for you and me but but we have to receive it. He says this. He says, more uh, those who receive, he said, death reigned through the one man. How much more will those who receive, and this is what we have to receive, the abundance of grace. There's two things here. An abundance of grace, the abundant provision of grace, and the gift of righteousness. Amen. Your righteousness, my righteousness is not earned. It's a gift. Amen. I mean, like, we just got to hand out. Jesus is like, gift. This is mine? Yeah, that, that's who you, righteous. So sin is, is, is an identity problem. More than anything else, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And when I, when I see that and I, when I know the love of God, it's from that place that, that I live for him. It's knowing the love of God. It says, how much more if they will receive the abundance of grace, number one, and the gift of righteousness, will they reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? When you and I reign in life, uh, guess what doesn't reign? Sin, addiction, condemnation, all the things that seem to like to run our lives, depression, lack. When you receive the abundance of grace, and the gift of righteousness, you and I will reign in life. We'll rule because we've, we've been made to rule. We, when he came, he, he picked us up and he set us up high to rule. We've been seated with Christ in heavenly places to rule. This is in Ephesians. But this is what Jesus' work on the cross, the death, burial, and resurrection did for you and me. It provided for you and me the gift of an abundance of grace the, and the gift of righteousness if you'll receive it. That's if you'll receive it. It's to all who would receive or all who would believe he gave power to become children of God, the Bible tells us. 
Verse 18. So then, just as one man's trespass brought condemnation for all men, so also one act of righteousness brought justification and life for all men. For just as through the disobedience of one man the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man the many will be made righteous. Thank you, Lord. So the law came in, verse 20, the law came in so that the trespasses would increase. This is interesting. If we're going to look at this next week. But the law came in so that the trespasses would increase. When, God, when Moses received the, the Ten Commandments for the children of Israel, that was not God's plan. I, I don't know if we have read this. But when he wanted, he said, get the people ready. Don't have them not touch the mountain, because if they do, they will die. We're going to look at this. But they, they said, no, no, but in lightnings and, 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 and cloud, that they were, uh, they were afraid. Amen. What they didn't know. They didn't know. They, 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 saw, the way, they saw the works of God. They, they, they saw the, the frogs and the, the, this is after they've been, they saw the Red Sea split. They saw the works of God. They saw his power and his might. They saw all of these things. But did they know why? Did they know why his power was used for them? Did they know why? He was coming to show them why. Moses knew the ways of God. The children of Israel only knew the works of God. And because of that, they were afraid. And he was coming to them and they said, no, 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 no. You have them just tell us what to do. We got this. And the Lord's like, you can't do it. You, you, you can't do it. And I refuse to, I refuse to live without you. Like, I, I love you so much that I, this kind of sounds like John 3.16. God loves you so much that he sent his only son. That whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. He did not send his son into the world to condemn it. But through him, this is this picture. This is what was going on. He, he said, you can't do it. And he said, but if you think you can, here's the law. If you think you can, here's the law. So verse 20 of Romans 5, here's why the law was given. The law came in so that trespasses and sin would increase. So you know what would happen? You would know how much of a sinner you are. That you and I would know. It's important that we would know that how much of a sinner that there was no way for me except through Christ. But because of Christ, because of Christ, I no longer am on the mountain uh, that was smoking and thundering of Mount Sinai. Now I've moved from Mount Sinai to a place of a habitation, Mount Zion, the, the place, the city of the Lord. Like, there's a different place that I transfer. So no longer am I a sinner only saved by grace. No, now I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I am who he's made me to be. And from that place, I'm to live. The law came in so that trespass would increase. But this is, I love this verse. But where sin increased, God, grace just said, my grace, my desire to bless you, my desire to be good towards you is so much greater than your sin. God's desire to be good to you, to be good to me, is so much greater than my sin. The law came in so that the trespasses would increase. But where sin increased, grace increased all the more. So that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Grace reigns through righteousness. When you and I understand the gift of righteousness, we'll be so much in who we are in Christ. We'll be so much more uh, apt to appropriate grace in our lives. 
all of his grace. Why is it that we don't appropriate the grace of God so many times? It's because we look on the outside. I'm looking at me. See, the law causes us to look at self, where grace causes us to look at him. Oh, God, you're so good. And so then I love him because he loved me. My love for him is a result of his love, the love of God for me. I need to understand that God loves me. Lord, open the eyes. I pray that the eyes of our understanding would be enlightened. We'd know this picture. But Father, as he prayed in that's Ephesians 1, and then he moved into Ephesians 3, that we have this prayer. And I pray that, that, that we would be able to grasp beyond here but that we would know intimately for ourselves how wide, how deep this love, this kind of love, this kind of, this kind of lay down my life for you kind of love, the cross kind of love, that we would grasp that, that we would hear that again. You know what we're going to do? We're going to, hear this, uh, we're going to hear this same message over the next six weeks again and again. We're going to hear wider. We're going to hear taller. We're going to hear deeper. We're going to hear that I am convinced my, my, here's the deal. My, my goal in this message is that you would be convinced. Now, I am convinced that there is nothing that can separate me from the love of God. And I know that I, because I'm loved, I can come boldly and ask and appropriate the grace and the mercy to help in time of need. Is there need somewhere? Because here's what I see. I see need all around. And you know what? He's got his body, the church. He said, when they know how much they're loved, he said, there'll be glory to God throughout the church, to all generations for, for the love of God. We're going to hear the love of God. We're going to look at Abraham. We're going to look and we're going to hear again. We're going to go to Romans 8. We're going to look again in Corinthians. We're going to look at Galatians. We're going to see what is he talking about. Instead of just one scripture, we're going to look at these pieces of just God's love for you, God's love for me. It's not based because I have something together. It's based because of who I am. Even angels were wondering about this. What is man? What is man that you're so mindful of him? Who is this human? What is this that you, are, that you would make him the object of your affection? I'll say this this way. If the angels were taken back, not able to comprehend the great love for man, I think you and me, we're not going to get it here. No, we can't get it here. But you know what can happen? Romans chapter 12, verse 2. We can be changed. We can be changed from one degree of glory to the next. We can be changed. It says that we're not conformed to the pattern of the world, but we're transformed. There's a transforming that happens as we renew our mind. Our mind is renewed, and there's an inside. Now, what was in us all along, I, I as I was reading I was reading in this last night, there's always, as I wrote this, there's always been flying in you. Worm. Caterpillar. There's always been flying in you. You know those things that you desire that, that's always been in there. It just needs to come out. Who you are and who he's made you to be and, and the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, it's always been in there. Those desires to see the broken restored, the lost found, the healed, or the, the sick healed, it's always been in there. It's always been in there. It just needs to come out. You know how it comes out? When we have an understanding of who we are and we're changed from one degree of glory as we're, our mind is renewed. There's a transformation. There's a metamorphosis that happens that you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing, perfect will. Let's stand this morning. Thank you, Lord. Or this afternoon. <laughs> huh? Not quite. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord.
We're just going to close our eyes this morning and receive the gift, the gift that was given to us. You know, um, just receive the gift. Because he didn't come to you or me based upon our merits. He came based on his love for us, his love for you. He said, if you'll receive, if you'll receive the gift of righteousness that comes through Jesus, if you'll receive the abundance of his grace, you can reign. How do you receive? We quote this often, but you receive the word of God when you and I receive it in our hearts and then because we believe it, we say it with our mouth. We come into agreement. That's really what confession means. It means to come into agreement with or to say the same thing. Could you say the same thing that God says about you? That's your choice. That's your choice. This morning, if... um, I just, I just see that. I, uh, th- that's what we're going to do together as, a, as, as this body this morning, just as every person here in this room, that we're going to receive by faith his love, the gift of Jesus. A lot of us have been saved. We've, uh, maybe, uh, we've, been, we've given our lives to the Lord or we've prayed a prayer, but maybe we, we didn't understand it fully, and I don't believe any of us have fully understanding by any means. But what we're going to pray this morning is we're going to pray that the Lord would open our eyes and that we would know a greater dimension of his love, a dimension as in wider, higher, deeper, further than I've known it before. And then I'm going to give an invitation if you've never made Jesus your Lord for to call on him. But I want to pray that prayer first and just, Lord, teach us, show us. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for Jesus, the demonstration of your love for us. Lord, let us, let us know it in ways that we haven't known it before. Let us know your love. Let us know it in a greater measure, a greater measure, a wider, a taller, a deeper measure than we've ever known it before, that it would reach further, that we would see your love and your kindness all the way into our family, into our children, into our bodies, into our fight, Father, every component, into into eternity, that we would just know a greater facet and measure of your love. Show us. Teach us through intimacy. Teach us more of your goodness and your kindness and your grace towards us. Teach us more. The Bible says that by grace, yet through faith, are you saved. And faith is the release of your words to believe that God sent Jesus, his son, to die on the cross for your sins and my sins. He said, if any man believes in him, confess him as Lord, you be saved. It's that simple. It's that simple. It's that simple. So if that's you this morning and you, uh, maybe you're uh, never, you don't know where you'd spend eternity. You don't, never made, made a declaration of Jesus being your Lord. I'm going to lead you in that prayer this morning. And, or maybe you're just coming back to the Lord. Let me just say this. If the Lord's drawn you to him, always yield. Don't get caught up here. Always yield. Always yield. You don't know. Don't get caught up here. Just always, always yield. It might be he's, he's wanting just, a, a, I don't know, just he knows what's best for you. Amen? Amen. So if that's you on either of those uh, occasions, if you don't never made Jesus your Lord or you just give it, giving your life back to him today and you just feel like you're supposed to appropriate by faith the, uh, 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 salvation, not from your works, but through Jesus, um, we're going to pray, the, uh, I'm going to lead you in a prayer, all right? So... Uh, your head's bowed, your eyes closed. Just you and him this morning. Just say to him, Father, today I call upon Jesus for my salvation. Not my works, 
not my past, but Jesus for my righteousness. I believe that you sent Jesus, your son, for me. Today, I make him my Lord, my Savior, my righteousness. Thank you for the gift of Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You know, if you prayed that prayer um, this morning and, and, and maybe it's for the first time or just you want some help just to walk with the Lord, you know, we have tools that we'd love to get in your hands. Um, but come up after, right down in front. We'll have some people pray with you, get tools in your hands. Um, other than that, we will see you guys on Wednesday for Small Group Wednesday. And you guys have a great week. God bless. Thank you for joining us. We hope you were strengthened and encouraged by the Word of God. If you need prayer, feel free to text us at the number on the screen below. You can also send us an email to info at beyondchurch.org or submit a prayer request form on our website at beyondchurch.org. If you'd like to partner with us in preaching Jesus, you can give securely online through our app or website, or if you prefer to mail your gift, send it to the address shown below. Stay connected with us throughout the week. You can download the app for all of our latest messages and announcements, and be sure and follow us on our socials at Beyond Church. If you've never attended in person, we highly encourage you to plan a visit. You'll never regret prioritizing godly community. We love you and hope to see you soon.